Good afternoon. I, we'd like to get started if you can all take a seat. Good afternoon, my name is Denise Jurgensen and I am the chair of the Women's Fund and I'd like to welcome you all to this wonderful forum. We had almost 600 pre-reservations, so we've got a full house. Um, I want to just give you a little bit of background on the Women's Fund and talk about some of the people that helped bring this forum to Reading. Uh, the Women's Fund was funded in 2008 to address persistent issues facing women and families in our area. Through memberships and collective giving, the Women's Fund is able to educate, award grants, and build an endowment so that we're able to continue th these efforts well into the future. This is our 16th forum. This is by far the best attended. Our mental health forum um, in September had three, uh, 300 plus people, so this is just an amazing turnout. Kind of shows that this is what we need to be bringing forth in our community. Um, the Women's Fund was a, ha, la, it has, in the last six years, awarded $215,000 in grants to, to community organizations and done such things as some of you have seen the, uh, the ones where we helped women get corrective dental work, which now the Seroptimists carry on. This year we awarded a really interesting grant to a group that's doing firefighting training for women, which is nice. Um, Shasta College ha was awarded a grant where they did some alternative careers for women and they continued with that and now they have a program out there where you can learn heavy equipment operating and things like that and I work for Caltrans in my other job so that's a great thing to bring more women into our field. Uh, we also, um, but we really couldn't do this growing membership in our partnerships without the community. So you being here shows what a great support you are of our organization. I want to make a special thank you to Reading Bank of Commerce and U.S. Bank because they continue to support the Women's Fund monetarily, and we really appreciate that. I also want to thank the Record Searchlight, who's one of our new partners. This is our second forum with them, and they're a wonderful partner. They help us get the word out. They're live tweeting and, and showing it on video. Um, so it's just been a wonderful partnership. And this particular forum, we also partnered with the Shasta Community Health Center, which has also been a really great experience. So at this time, I would like to, uh, oh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my cabinet. I have 13 other cabinet members who are some really dynamic women that work very hard to bring these kind of things to the community. And also the committee that put this on, Kristen and some other people that really, the reason you're here is because they did all the hard work. So I would like to introduce Silas Lyon, who is the editor of the Record Searchlight, and Brandon Thornock, who is with Chest Community Health, and they will introduce your speaker. Thank you, Denise, and uh, thank you to the Women's Fund, everybody who's here from the cabinet and from the uh, fund. I just want to say how much we appreciate that partnership uh, and the work that you're doing in the community. And I also want to thank uh, the uh, Shasta Community Health Center for uh, co-sponsoring this with us. I think it's uh, so important. People ask me a lot um, whether newspapers have a future. And you know that's uh, is, since it's an existential question, I've given a little bit of time to it. <laughs> and my answer uh, won't surprise you. My answer is yes, uh, but it's yes because it's yes because newspapers like ours and communities like this can choose to be part of making their community better. And if we do that, I truly believe that we will remain relevant and that our future will be strong. And so this is an act of self-interest on our part, uh, but we are delighted to be here because we believe that this is a really important issue for our community and that bringing new voices and new ideas into the community from outside and working with community partners to do that is a really important part of our mission. So I wanna thank everybody who's allowed us to be a part of this. Welcome you all here and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Silas and Denise. Uh, my name is Brandon Thornock. I'm the Director of Clinical Operations at Shasta Community Health Center. And it's my honor to introduce you to today's speaker, Lloyd Pendleton. 
And so I'm going to go ahead and read his bio, but he's asked us to show a, a real quick clip before he comes up on stage. So once I finish, he'll go ahead and show that clip and then, and then we'll give the floor over to Lloyd. Lloyd Pendleton. For more than 11 years, Lloyd has been an advocate for the homeless. In 2004, as a part-time loaned executive, he took the lead in writing and implementing the state of Utah's 10-year plan for ending chronic homelessness. In 2006, Lloyd retired from his employment and went to work for the state as director of the Homeless Task Force to continue implementation of the plan to end chronic homelessness and reduce overall homelessness by 2015. As of the 2015 January point in time homeless count, the state of Utah had reduced their chronic homelessness by 91%. Lloyd left state employment June 1, 2015 is now, and is now speaking and consulting across the country sharing how they accomplished this reduction. Because of his work with Utah's homeless population and the agencies that serve them, he was awarded the 2009 Governor's Award for Excellence. Also, in 2009, Lloyd was selected as one of the 39 Purpose Prize Fellows from 1,200 applicants as a social entrepreneur in a second career. Lloyd also was loaned by the state of Utah to the United States Interagency Council on homelessness for six months, September 1, 2012 to March 1, 2013, where he worked with the Department of Justice on reducing homelessness for those coming out of incarceration. Prior to his appointment with the state, Lloyd was in management with Ford Motor Company for 14 years. After leaving Ford, Lloyd worked for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Welfare Department for 26 years, where he worked in many positions, including controller of the bishop's storehouses and canneries, bishop's storehouse manager, plus managing several operational units. He was also instrumental in assisting with the development and implementation of a worldwide humanitarian program for the LDS Church, including managing the Humanitarian Center for several years. Lloyd is a graduate of Brigham Young University and holds a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's of business administration. He is married and has two daughters and four grandchildren. So without further ado, For the opera. Are we okay? Voice wise, voice wise, we're good. All right. You can hear everyone back there, all right? The back, good. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> what did you think? <clears throat> it's kind of fun when they called me and said, You're the reddest of red states. How are you able to accomplish this? We want to come out and see. So it took about two and a half months to finally get a date to come out. And I didn't know how it was going to come out because I had no idea what the questions they're going to ask me. So it was totally unscripted on my part. Scripted on their part, but not on my part. But they did a very nice job. And so it's been very helpful to get the message out that housing does work and you end homelessness by putting people into housing. Pretty basic, pretty simple. So what I'm going to do today is to share with you how we did what we did and what I've distilled out as the principles that I think that are important that can be applied here in your community. Now, I want to say at the beginning, you all come with a different perspective. The chief of police, is he here? Police here? Oh, yeah, he's here. He has a different perspective. He's dealing with a criminal activity. So there is criminal activity among the homeless, no question. You have drug dealers who will merge in with the homeless people. The homeless people do use drugs. They're addicted. They have alcohol issues. They have mental health issues. Uh, also, the homeless population sometimes get lumped into one big homeless. That's it. We're all homeless. We're all the same. No, you need to segment the market. There's the chronically homeless, which is the unaccompanied adult that's been homeless a long time, has a disabling condition. They're very expensive. That represents about 10% of the population. Then you have the family homeless, which represents 30 to 40, 40 to 50% of the homeless population. Then you have the single adults. You have the homeless youth. You have the domestic violence victim. They all need different interventions. So, as we, as I share this information with you, uh, 
I'm just going to share lots of ideas, and then you're going to need to, as a community, take these ideas that you think will work for you and adapt them and put them to work here. But to me, there's underlying principles that can apply everywhere. And you can do it. You say you don't have enough resources. You're already incurring the cost for these individuals that cost twenty to $45,000 a year per person on the street in your jail time, emergency room visits, everything else. So, <clears throat> and there's accountability. And, and we're a very conservative state. Personally, I'm very conservative. I'm the small government uh, into that standpoint, but I'm also into caring. So don't, please don't walk away to say, well, he said this is how you solve all the problems. No, you have to segment the market, look at your interventions that are most appropriate and most effective, and deal with that. So I just want to make that general statement. Secondly, I just want you to think about some questions on the John Stewart piece. Uh, what's your takeaway? You know, and you have a view. Your view of the homeless population, I call them homeless citizens, your view will impact how you act and how you react. So I'm hoping through today, this morning, that your view will change. Because we all bring a bias, we all bring a perspective, and examining that bias and perspective is very important to take a look at what is your reaction. What are you willing to do, not do? Because um, <clears throat> it affects what actions you take, etc. So I'd like to use that clip to kind of begin to give you an idea that yes, I do see our homeless citizens as individuals, as people, as part of our citizenry. It changes how I treat them compared to when I was a kid on the ranch and I would see the hobos, we call them then, and I would say, get a job, you lazy bums, and go to work. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Well, I've come to learn that they don't have any boots to pull themselves up by right now. They've lost their hope. We have the opportunity to bring hope. So, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank you. You're here because you care. You're here because you care. That's huge. As Bernie Sanders says, that's huge. <laughs> I know you saw him on Saturday Night Live, but uh, he's kind of a fun, fun candidate. That's huge. You care. And I have not run into a person that doesn't care, even if they say, get a job, you lazy bums, and pull yourself out by the bootstraps. That's their way of caring. That was my way of caring. Not very effective. So as we go through this, I hope to make a paradigm shift. Now, I had a paradigm shift that occurred for me, because, and, and it, it really got example, exemplified, but I was working out in my backyard a couple of years ago, and my neighbor was in his backyard working away, and he had some grass grow up quite high, and so he was weed whacking, and he had some headphones on, he was going along, and he tripped over a little stump that had grown up there, a little you know, sap, and his weed whacker went over, and his cat had followed him out and crouched down in the grass and just sitting there. Weed whacker went over and cut off the cat's tail. Startled him. He put down these weed whacker, took off his headphone, and he went over and he picked up the tail, and he went over and he got the cat who had run into the corner of the uh, yard and got out his handkerchief and put on the stubby tail and came over to me and said, Lloyd, will you run me down to Walmart? <laughs> I said, Walmart? Why Walmart? There's an animal hospital on the way. He said, well, why not Walmart? It's the world, world's largest retailer. I know it's a groaner, <clears throat> but it's a paradigm shift. <laughs> so hopefully you will occur, have a paradigm shift occur today for you as we walk. You just got it? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. There's always one that laughs about one minute later. <laughs> so thank you, because without your caring and your interest, a change in how you do what you do will not occur. Now, there will be resistance, there will be conflict, but I've also come to realize that without conflict, you never generate the energy necessary to make the needed changes. So I welcome conflict. Now, you need to be civil, but conflict is important. 
because you're beginning to challenge the assumptions. You're beginning to help people take a look at their biases and their attitudes. And so that conflict really should be welcomed and engaged because it's creating the energy you need to bring about the needed change. That's the challenge. That's the exciting part. That creates the juices that get flowing. So, I wanted to just take a minute and talk and take a look at it. I did some analysis of your 2015 point in time count. Now, I want to put this perspective there so you kind of have some questions. So, basically, what I have here, this is the 15 count. And then there's the homeless population for Shasta County, Utah, and national. Unsheltered, chronic homeless individuals, veterans, persons, and families. And I annualize this, and then here's your population. So, 91,000. I guess that's, that's Reading. I asked Google to give me Shasta County, and I got looking. It's like 178,000 for Shasta County. And so, I realized last night when I was looking at this that I didn't have the correct number, so you have to adjust for that. So, in your county, you had 591 people you counted last year. I had a count last week or a week and a half ago, so you have a new one. We had 3,000 that we counted last year. That's for the whole state of Utah. And nationally, there's 565,000 that were counted nationally on that point in time count. So you have 91,000. That's three hundredths of a percent of the national population. You have one-tenth of one percent of the homeless population nationally. We have five-tenths of one percent of the homeless population. You had unsheltered. 59% of your people were unsheltered. For us, it was 7.5%. That was counted in the winter. HUD mandates that every community counts the homeless population the, sometime in the last 10 days of January. And the reason for that is, in the northern part of the country, we open an emergency shelter from November 1 to April 1st. So we have hundreds of people in the emergency shelter because they can freeze to death there. And a lot of communities do that. So they basically made that rule. You count then, and everybody counts, because 25% of your homeless population are transient. And if you count throughout the year, you're going to have a double count. So they just say, you do, because at 10 days, you're not going to get that much of a double count. So they, you ask, why in January? You know, it's tough to get, you know. For us, it can be zero. You have volunteers going out at midnight and knocking on tents and asking who they are. Or look, you know, and we go out at midnight or early in the morning, four o'clock. So, but they do that. So that's um, so we have seven and a half percent, and thirty percent so are unsheltered nationally. Chronic homeless, you have two hundred eighty-six, which is forty-eight uh, percent <coughs> of your people are chronic homeless. You have that's a high. Normally, it's ten percent, ten to twelve percent is the national average for chronic homeless. In fifteen percent here, chronic homeless. So you're disproportionate there. So that either says you haven't counted all the other homeless people, you just got these, or you really have a misrepresentation there. Uh, that's quite a high percentage. And 76% of those were unsheltered. For us, it was 7.3% were unsheltered. We have empty shelter beds. We've taken enough chronic homeless people out of the shelter, which would be 400 days, 450 days on average over a two or three year period in the shelters. We've taken them out and put them into housing when you take them out, then you can put 10 and a half people in that same bed over the next 12 months of the temporarily homeless. So uh, we have empty shelter beds, which we think is great because no one has to be on the street. Some stay there because of mental health issues. Um, and then veterans, you had 15% were 11, nationally is 8.5. Persons and families, 14% were 40%, 36 nationally. Then I annualize because 80% of the homeless population are temporarily homeless, 30, 60 days. Generally families, they become homeless, they fall into, they go into the shelter, in the car, they get counted, then they get some assistance, they get networked in, and they're off and going, and you don't see them yet. 80% are temporarily homeless. 10% are episodically homeless, and 10% are chronically homeless, long term. So that's basically how your market breaks out. So your intervention for those that are temporarily homeless is different. That can be single men or women. That can be domestic violence so survivors, families. So that's a different intervention than the chronically homeless. So that's part of segmenting your market again. So basically, you need to 
capacitized, and we did this study in the homeless management information system. When you count people on that night, and you take a look at how many people will sleep in that bed for the next 12 months, there will be five people on average. For chronic homeless, it will be two people on average. So I annualize the numbers to give an idea of what a community needs to look at in the way of how many people you will be serving during that time period. So that's five times your non-chronic, two times your chronic. So you have 2,000. Uh, we have 14,000, 2.6 million. And I take that as a percent of the population of the community. So that's 8 tenths of a percent, 5 tenths of a percent, and 2.3. Okay, that will be cut in half because I have a number here that's not correct for your county. And this is for your county up here. So you're looking at, you know, one, one and a half or 1.2 percent of your community. So that's higher than what we are and higher nationally. So you have a higher proportion of your population that is homeless. You need to realize that so you can address that. Now, if you go to Los Angeles, it's like 3.5. It's way out of proportion. 20% of the homeless population in the country are in LA, or in California, mostly in LA. So those are the realities as you take a look at your numbers and you begin to put your strategic planning process together. So um, does that kind of help kind of frame it for you? I like to kind of step back and see the big picture when I go to a community. Where are you in your homeless situation? Because quite often the community will say, we have all these homeless people, but when you look at it on a kind of a national and a, and a per broader perspective, they're average. You're average. You're a little above average. Any questions on that? Just shout it out. Okay. <clears throat> Here's our chronic homeless chart. 2005, 1932. We've just been working away. Housing, housing, housing. We're down to 178. 91% reduction. And we've been focusing on that. <clears throat> People say, well, you have all these homeless families and you have everything else and all that. Yes, and, and we didn't change any of that. We just kept doing an even better. But I have found you need to pick one of your target population and drill it down and focus on it. It will discipline your system and you can't do everything all at once. It really is important to drill down and say, right, how do we solve this, and just stay doggedly attached to it. So I've been 13 years as a part-time loaned out executive and a full-time person carrying that message across the state. It can be done. Here's the common vision. Here are the issues. You change political leaders. You have to educate them. So it's a continual process of a consistent message of what your vision statement is. And it can be done. People need to be educated. They need to be inspired. They need to be motivated. They need to be threatened. No, no, don't threaten them. <clears throat> but you need to get their attention. Attention. And here's a solution. It works. We even had one mayor in a fairly major city in Utah. I could not get him to come to Salt Lake to see our homeless housing. Yet he had a lot of homeless there. We had to fly him to Denver, Colorado, pay his airfare, we flew in in the morning, flew out at night, and a couple of us went with him to meet with the mayor of Mayor Hickenlooper, who's now the governor, Governor Hickenlooper. He was the mayor of Denver and had been doing some pretty significant things. We had to fly him to meet with the mayor for 20 minutes, take a tour of two of their permanent supportive housing facilities for him to catch the vision of what it is we were doing. He wouldn't come to Salt Lake 45 miles south. So you have to take sometimes extraordinary measures to get people to buy in, especially those that are in key positions. And he basically bought in. He began to catch the vision and began to support the effort in that community. So there are ways around through, over, and under. If you're barrier-oriented, you'll find plenty of barriers. If you're solution-oriented, you'll find the solution. So I see you as being solution-oriented. You want to make something happen differently than what's happening right now. Right? Great. Kristen, you got that? <laughs> All right. She's your champion. I'm very impressed. I'm going to talk a little bit more about her in a minute. Okay, so people ask, why has Utah been successful? 
I basically, I've kind of boiled it down to these three points. Champions, which are absolutely key, and it isn't going to happen if you don't have some champions. It just won't happen. You can awfulize, you can come to have meetings, and you can meet for months and weeks and days and years, which is kind of typical for government. We have a committee, a blue ribbon committee, and they're going to study this. And then they study it for a year, and they make a wonderful report. And the press are there, a wonderful report. And then nothing happens because you have a new elected official or somebody to come up. So uh, champions become key. They keep the issue before you and are looking at solutions. You need to be collaborative. We're very collaborative. I just, we started this, and we just did it. We didn't go out and do a big media campaign. We just did it. And we got together, the governor's office, the state staff, the communities, the mayors, the service providers, and we created a common vision, and we just put it together and did it. All this media came because it just came. We didn't go after it because we did it. We just went out and did it. We weren't trying to make ourselves famous or anything. It was just a need, and we saw it happen. But I've had people come in, and when they see what we do, they, one person said, I would kill for the collaboration you have here, you know, metaphorically. <clears throat> and yet he was one of the leaders in his community. So collaboration becomes key because you just can't do it alone. And when you're fragmented, it creates issues. You misuse, duplicate, overlap, have big gaps in your services. So collaboration becomes key. And I've visited some of the agencies here. You have some great agents. The Rescue Mission, count your blessings. They are really good. Our rescue mission, I mean, they do good work, no question, but they're isolated, do their own thing, and are not part of the community discussion. I know the executive director is a good man, and they do good work. That isn't the question. But you have an extraordinary leader who's willing to come and become part of your community solution, really, and some others that you have some, the, the, two that are, three that have visited. You have good assets here that you can begin to build on, no question. And then compassion. So, I'm going to talk about that. Champions. I went to a conference in 2003, May of 2003, and you go to conferences, you read a book, and, um, and you get an idea. But every now and then you go to a conference that gives you a whole different perspective, and you say, oh, it's one of those aha moments. Wow. It gave you a diff me a different view. And the thing that, after th for three days, the thing I took away from that conference was the study they did on champions. They observed over decades that there are several public works projects that were being done, same size, same size community, and some were flaming successes and some were flaming failures. They couldn't figure out why. It's the same kind of project. And they went in and they did a study and they found out the difference was a champion. And they don't only just they study the champion, they study the characteristics of the champion. What is it in the champion that caused this thing to occur? And they said, you can have lots of money, you can have lots of ideas, but if you don't have a champion, it will not come to pass. It will not be accomplished. So, and I flew in at 4 o'clock yesterday. I met Kristen. For me, she is one of your champions. And the mayor here? Oh, there you are. Sorry. Now, she has your back. She's, you're very, she's a very important, in a very important position. You're all very important people. She's in a very important position. And I talked to her this li last night. She can convene people, but she needs a champion like Kristen and others to do the legwork to bring the issues to her. And where is the head of the uh, supervisors? I saw her earlier. What do you call that person? The mayor? I know, but what do you call yourself? Chair. Chair, okay. Chair. Um, they can convene people uh, and begin to set the, the tone, the strategy, the direction. Very important. But, so what I want to do is have, I want Kristen, why don't you come up here? Let's just talk about these, okay? I want, let's give her a hand. You're lucky <clears throat> that, that, that you have this, uh, I mean, when I go out and speak, if there isn't somebody like this, I fly away two days later and say, they really won't make it. 
and I've done, I mean, I go in and I speak to Rotary Club, Chamber of Commerce, whatever, and okay, it was interesting, and they, it was wonderful and everything else, and I go in and say, nothing's going to change. But when I go to a community and I find somebody like Kristen, things will change. Now, I don't know, this may not work, but um, I want to walk through. Okay, first they found a champion needs to have energy. So, <laughs> is this an energetic person? Yeah, absolutely. So, stamina and staying power, enthusiasm and optimism, a sense of humor, all part of that. Check? Yeah, Check. A bias to act, solve problems, not decry them. Focus on solutions, sense of urgency, opportunity driven. Check? Check. All right. I was in Everett, Washington, um, November. Uh, they had a, a staff person in the community, or in the uh, mayor's office, that had been for two years, he'd been a prosecutor in the county and, and been prosecuting all these homeless people and it wasn't solving the problem. So we kept checking around and he got a hold of me and said, come on up. So I went up, met with the mayor. We had a meeting like this, 350 people showed up in the evening community and he was there and he introduced me and he got up and said, here's what we're going to do. And I had challenged them to say, you need to do pilots. Have five people housed by February 1 and he committed to have that and 20 housed by June. It changes the dynamics of the discussion when you create an urgency. You just start doing, and you learn as you go. You basically know what you need to do. He called me, he and his staff, February 1, said, we have five people, and they're going in. He said, what happened when we started to do this and started to identify the five, work with the police, and get the housing? It changed the discussion in the community. People came, they were excited, five people. Something was being done. And they began to see opportunities. They saw this line, because they're thinking housing for the chronically homeless. And this, they saw this property. Oh, that could be a great place. So they were excited about reporting on that. Opportunities will start to arrive when you begin to change your paradigm. You make that paradigm shift, Walmart or whatever. You make that paradigm shift, you will begin to see opportunities. The Holiday Inn that we converted. You know, the homeless shelter said, you know, we need that. The housing authorities were busy with other projects. So the the homeless organization bought it and rehabbed it, and they manage it. 220 adults, 50 to 70 children. They saw the opportunity because they were thinking, how do we get there? All right, next. <clears throat> Results-oriented. Outcome, not process. Get up. No, no, get back up here. <clears throat> we're not done yet. That was just two of seven. So... Outcome, not process, matters most. Networking capacity, need for achievement, clear and compelling, revision for success, charts and uses, milestone. Check? Have you been talking to my husband? Yes. <laughs> she there? Yeah. Personal responsibility takes responsibility for their own behavior. Did I mess up? Sure. You make mistakes, but I don't see them as mistakes because I learn the most from what we call mistakes. They're my grace learning experience. So when I go to bed at night, rather than say, oh, I screwed that up, I, d I pray and ponder, and then I will ponder and say, I will recreate that event and reframe it in a positive way, restate in a positive way at the appropriate time. So when I go to sleep, I'm going to sleep on a positive experience rather than a negative experience. So I reframe it and send it out to the universe. So I learn from my mistakes, so therefore there are no mistakes. So I try to take diligently my personal responsibility. So, check. Okay. Belief in common good, looking beyond what is good for their own families and friends, see and feel the impact of others, builds on diversity, activate shared values. Check? Yep. Incline the teams. Provide the juice to know they, provide the juice but know they need an engine. Form teams of different and not like-minded. Share credit as well as information. Seek creation, not agreement. There's nothing more exciting than creating. 
creating is exciting and enthusiastic, energizes. There's nothing more frustrating when you're not getting anything created. It's just bureaucracy and it's bogged down. It wears you out. Work doesn't wear you out. Stress wears you out, distress. But when you're gaining the results and you're having that kind of excitement, you're energized. Check. Yep. You're a champion. <laughs> Give her a hand. Thanks. <clears throat> you have other champions. I just use her because I've gotten to know her. I've met some other great champions. So you build your champion base because there'll be champions in different segments. You're champions. So step up, and as this strategy comes together and get to the mayor and the chair and say, I want to be part of this new result. I want to be part of this new strategy planning. I want to be able to do something to contribute to this. You are part of that energy. You're part of that. Being here indicates you have an interest. You're blessed, a caring population, caring citizenry. So yes, you are very important. You are very important. Collaboration. So, who needs to be at the table? I've just thrown up some of the list up here. Your stakeholders become very important. Your community service providers, your political leaders, your businesses, your uh, advocates. All of those need to be at the table. So faith-based leaders, you have faith-based leaders here? I understand the Bethel Church is a powerhouse in your community. Your other churches are a powerhouse. It's in their theology, it's in their basic vision to reach out to serve and to bring hope. Tap into that, organize that, focus that even more so. That comes through collaboration, that's come through getting together and say, what do I bring to the table? What can you bring to the table? What are the needs? Where can we expand into? What are the gaps? They're driven as individuals and as an organization, so tap into that faith-based. Uh, business leaders, faith, homeless service providers, public safety, the police and the sheriff, very important. Look, you bring hope to them. I talk to a lot of police. They, don't, they get to know these ladies and men. They don't want to haul them off to jail, but they have no other place to take them. If they have a place to take them for housing, it brings hope to the police. Not only hope to the homeless, but hope to the police. Too many communities expect the police to solve the homeless problem. They don't have the capacity to do that. They don't have the wherewithal to do that. They're to deal with crime and to keep us safe. They're a very important part of this. But please don't give them this responsibility that is not really theirs. That's yours as a community. And ours is the community. We have a meeting every Tuesday at 2.30. 25, 20 to 25 people, including the police, are there. We have five housing openings up next, next week. We need to find these five people. The police, okay, I know I saw Pete over there last, you know, yesterday. I'll go get, the police go get him and bring him into the housing. Because they're out on the street, they see them. Outreach workers out there. Outreach workers, the service providers, the state employees, the city employees, county employees, all coming together to say, how do we then identify the next five people who need the housing that's becoming available. They're part of the solution, very important. It's a different dynamics that occurs. Would you like that, Chief? Absolutely. He's waiting for it, aren't you? Sure. So, stakeholders become important, and we could talk more about that, but that, you need to get them in there so you, you bring in. Question to consider. What needs to be done? How will it be done? A vision. Now, is home base here? But they're going to come up. I haven't met them. You've, you've had some really good study work done. What? Home base is here? Hey, great. I read through your reports. Good work. Good work. Now, the most frustrating for them would be you give them a pat on the back and say, good work, you did a nice study, they deliver the report, and nothing happens. Yeah. 
Over 400 10-year plans were written in 2003, 4, 5, and 6 to end chronic homelessness. Over 400 plans, blue ribbon committees, big press conferences. I'm aware of two plans that have been implemented. You're three, yes, way to go. <laughs> you have a good foundation there, and Kristen's gone out and gotten the money donated in order to get this, because you're going to be able to take a look at where you are. What are the assets? What are the resources? Where do we have gaps? What do we need to do? That gives you a good foundation in order to begin, to begin this or continue this process. So, uh, yes, that's great. But please implement it, and don't wait a year, mayor? What day do you want to pick to have five people housed? <coughs> <laughs> March 15th. <laughs> Way to go. Chair, what date do you want to pick? <laughs> Ah, good question. I think she meant next month. Didn't you? Yep. All right, Chair. All right, you're meeting next week. Five. Five. Oh, all right. Okay. Another five? I couldn't quite hear you. Yeah. Five county, five city. Okay. Way to go. <clears throat> now, when you create a vision, please don't say, we're going to end homelessness. You're focused on what you don't want. Focus on what you want. We want, to ha we want a housing opportunity for all of our homeless citizens, or chronic homeless citizens, or homeless veterans, whatever, homeless youth, homeless families, domestic violence survivors, whatever it is. You put a positive spin on it because you create an energy when you look forward or when you look back. Don't focus on what you don't want. Focus on what you want. Does that make sense? We want housing opportunities for every chronically homeless citizen, every homeless veteran. Then that's the vision you create, that's what you send out, that's what will start to come to pass. And when you bring 500, okay, there's a, there was a study done uh, in taking a look at creating the change and creating a vision, and, and, and they basically concluded that you need one-tenth of one percent of the population to create the necessary energy to bring about a change in the community. Focused on a common vision. So to change the world, you needed 8,000 people focused on a common vision to make a shift in the energy of the world. I was stunned when I read that, and they'd studied it in Israel and U.S. and all over the world, and they did the same kind of study to determine there's that kind of power when you get a group of people like you together, creating a common vision, looking forward, and you create and send out the energy and bring that in in order to achieve the result you want. So, as you craft your vision, which you will be doing, uh, housing is a major step, keeping them housed is key, uh, and why will it be done? Now, for those that are readers, here's a book I read, Start With Why. Because basically, <clears throat> um, you want to know, you can know, okay, we can do housing, and this is what we can do, and this is how we can do it, but why are you doing it? For those that are readers, Start With Why, Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, you may want to read through that, because it's basically get down to why are you doing what you're doing, because when you have the why, then you create additional energy, staying power. So I see that's been a very important, I find I've been rereading it because of what it does. Now, also in 1964, I think it was, three, King stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. All of you have been to the Lincoln Memorial? 
I jog up those every time I go. I run down the mall and jog up those steps and run around Lincoln, thank him for what he did. Then I jog down the steps and run back to my hotel. It's just a fun thing to go. I just admire that man. But King stood up there and he said, I have a dream. That every little black boy and every little white girl, black boy and black girl and white boy and white girl can hold hands and walk down and to it, you know, be judged by the character, not by the color of their skin. He did not get up there and say, I have a plan. <laughs> so you want a dream, a big hairy audacious goal of what you want your community to be. It's a dream. So whites, blacks, browns, yellows, whatever, short, obese, tall, thin, can buy into the dream. It's a dream you're creating. It's a vision of the future. That's what you're about. It's a vision and a dream. And we honor King for that. Go and listen to his speech again. It's powerful. He rallied us all. I have a dream. Not quite there yet, but we still have that dream. So the book talks about the how, the what, the how, and the why. Why are you doing it? We can spend more time, but I'll encourage you to read the book. So, sight is a function of the eyes, a vision is a function of the heart, and in the Old Testament, where there's no dream that people, a vision that people perish, you know, there's lots of interpretations of that, but to me, you know, if we don't come together and have this vision, then we struggle as a community, we, we, we don't survive, we don't do as well as we could. Vision for not against, uh, like housing, homeless versus ending, housing a major step, um, here's one, all homeless citizens achieve their maximum integration into society. Housing, just a piece of it. Stabilization, treatment, employment, reuniting with family. All of those are part of a vision like that. For us, everyone has access to safeties and affordable housing with the needs and resources and supports for self-sufficiency and well-being. As a community, we are committed to give, and the, vi and the mission statement is chronic right now and then veterans in 10 and families in 2020 and youth in 2020. That's the mission statement. But here, as a community, we are committed to giving a housing opportunity to every chronically homeless individual and every homeless veteran by the end of 2015. We can do that as a community. We know some will not come into housing. That's just a given. They will not come in. There's too many health, mental health issues. They will die on the street. That doesn't mean we don't give them a housing opportunity. We honor their choice. But we'll continue to outreach. There's one man they told me about in, Sa in Houston. They went out every day and offered a housing opportunity. On the 763rd invitation, he said, okay, I'll come in. <laughs> 763, they didn't give up. He said, I guess they care for me. Because they don't trust you when you go out first. They've been victimized. And you come out and say, I want to help you. Yeah, you want to tell me to get clean, dry, and sober and get a job. That ain't very helpful. It isn't very helpful. You need to meet them where they are, and you then begin to help them begin to create a vision and a dream and a hope within themselves. That's what you're bringing is hope. Hope. And you learning how to do that most effectively is part of the process. Not telling them to get a job and to pull themselves up by the bootstrap. That's not very hopeful and helpful. So, a couple of ideas for a mission statement, or a vision statement, dream statement. So, political leaders, house, okay, how, housing authority people here? That came up very slowly. <laughs> There's some hesitancy there, Kristen. Are you city or county? City. You're a very important part of this process, you know. Did you realize that? I'm gonna, okay. 
When we started, our housing authorities in the city and county of Salt Lake were at the table at the beginning, and they were willing to project-based Section 8 vouchers right from the get-go. And we have a lot of housing authorities around the state that's taken some time to educate them. Uh, it's a process. So they become important. As you bring on perm supportive housing, Section 8 vouchers being project-based become very important. Now, you appoint the board members, don't you? Yes, you do. You don't know that. I bet you. The housing authority. You're supportive, but you also appoint the board members. Oh, you are the board. Oh, what a deal. <laughs> Whoa. You, that even makes it easier. So, because a lot of housing authorities will say, well, we have a four-year waiting list. We've closed our waiting list, and we can't project base any of them. Well, these people will survive for four years, but this guy over here will die probably in the next five or six months if he doesn't get into housing. So it's a prioritization again. So it becomes very important that they're willing to project base Section 8 vouchers in order for this to cash flow and make it doable. And HUD encourages it. The only thing you, you know, so, so that's another whole discussion. We can have more discussion on that. But, but the county and the city housing authorities become very important in being part of the solution and educating. And if you need to talk to our housing authority folks, I can link you up so you can talk through the process and everything else. But you're a very important part of this process. But you're excited about being part of the process? They are. He nodded his head for the cameras. Okay. <laughs> And the uh, public safety. We're bringing hope. Your chief works very diligently. Your sheriff worked very diligently. Bring them into the discussion. They will bring perspectives that will be very important for you to take a look at as you develop your strategy. Very important. We can elaborate on that, but we need to move on to the next. You don't want to be like this person. <laughs> <coughs> Many times we take the road less traveled. Okay. So, uh, okay. Compassion. So, champions, collaboration, compassion. Who are our homeless people? Thomas, you willing to come up for a minute? Thomas, you willing to come up for a minute? Is, it, is this on? Whoops, somebody's calling me, darn it, and they shut it off. Sorry about that. Did you all turn off your phones? <laughs> Matter of fact, that happened to be a guy from uh, Honolulu. I'm headed over there in two weeks to work with the mayor over there. So, tell your story, if you would, just for a minute, Thomas. Well, I... Um I got out of prison in 97, and I was homeless. Um, two years ago, I uh, walked into the Good News Rescue Mission and uh, started staying there. They gave me meals, a warm bed to sleep in. I didn't have to sleep in a bush anymore, you know? And it was cold out there. I had clean clothes. Um, I didn't, didn't know how to be homeless, you know? Went to the mission for lunch one day, and I've been there ever since. Now I volunteer there every single day. Um, 13 hours. I got it uh, in a thing they called the money saving program. I saved enough money, now I live in my own home. I sleep in my own bed. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't have done it without the Good News Rescue Mission. You know, I had drug and alcohol problems. I got clean and sober. I got 16 months clean now. <laughs> I get up in the morning, I walk down and I volunteer for the mission. I sleep in my own bed, I watch my own TV. I have my own furniture now. <laughs> That's pretty much all I got. <laughs> That's a lot, thank you. He's a child of God. 
God loves him as much as he loves me or you or Kristen or the mayor or the chair. Yeah. Let's go over this, get over this idea of those people. I can pretty well guess and predict that within this audience here that in five years, two or three of you could be homeless. My guess is two or three of you have been homeless. Yes. Stand up. All right. It's hard. It's very hard. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Yes. Great. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> so, they are citizens of our community. They are citizens. People who are suffering and in need of hope. You have improved hope? Absolutely. Hope. You're bringing hope. I realize you have the bunch that comes up here in the summer that Chief was telling me about to kind of suck the resources off out of the homeless situation and harvest marijuana. That's a different intervention. They're not homeless. They're using the system. And there are people who do use the system. But the Thomases need a hand to feel loved and supported and a chance to change their life. That's what you're looking at. So these interventions you need to take a look at. It's not a sweeping. Some of them need to be held, I mean, we all, need, we all need to be accountable, but some need to be dealt with as criminal activity. So don't lump in the homeless with the criminal activity. Now, some of the homeless will commit crimes. And please don't criminalize just going to the bathroom and trying to eat or whatever, and if you stole some food because you're hungry, don't criminalize it. Some people try to do that and then have the police solve it. That doesn't solve it. No, there's better interventions. And I see them as my brothers and my sisters. And this was brought home to me last March. We were waiting for the governor to show up for a press conference, and we were out in the parking lot waiting for the team. He's a little late. I was talking to our outreach workers. We have several outreach teams that go out, and part of it is the medical team. You have a medical team here that goes out, and they go out to the camps and everything else. They also go out to the prostitutes. They call them sex workers. Uh, there's about 150. And, and they made the comment, they said, we have eight of those that had, that gave, eight women gave birth to 32 children taken away by the state. I said, what? Are you kidding me? No, say that again. Yeah. They have to earn 150, 100 to 100, 200 dollars a day to support their 100 dollar a day heroin addiction, their pimp, and to live. And at $25 to $35 a trip, they are very busy. Unprotected, more pay. Fetus gets created. So as I pondered that, I, I, I said, we need to get a committee. So we organized a committee to begin to deal with that. And I, first of all, I said, we ought to take the round these pimps up and shoot them. Sorry, I reverted back to my old ranch days. <laughs> I said, yeah, but these pimps, some of them are their parents, and some of them are their husbands. I said, what? Are you kidding me? I mean, I'm pretty naive and protected. It's like, wow. Okay, I want to meet these folks. So I get, 10 days later, I went out with a van. Went out and met the 20-year-olds, early 30-year-olds, 
these women working out there, the McDonald's, seedy motels, everything else. But these workers go out, these medical workers go out, and two of the team were ladies who were on the street two years ago and know these girls, they call them. They got hope, they got out, stabilized, got a job, and have changed their lives. And so they're going out and saying, all right, yes, you, you can do it, ladies. As I pondered this, my view, being a Christian, that I lived and we lived before we came here with Father in Heaven. And that when that fetus gets created, and when God put us here on Earth and gave us procreative powers, he did not say, if you're mentally, emotionally, physically, and financially stable, you can have children. He gave that opportunity to all of us. So when that fetus gets created, one of my brothers and one of my sisters up there gets to choose to come into that fetus. God doesn't force anybody. They knowingly say, I'm going into that very difficult circumstance. I'm going to have a drug-addicted physical body. And so I see those people who are willing to come into those circumstances as very valiant, brave individuals willing to take on that challenge here in mortality. I was too chicken to take it that tough. I said, send me out to the west desert of Utah, put me in a ranch, hard work, poverty, economic poverty, sleep in a bunkhouse that had no heat, so when it's 10 below, I'm running out and jumping in those cold sheets like... <laughs> uh, but, you know, you survive. I believe, and I had confirmation, that I agreed that I would come down and I would be able to have the opportunity to organize and to be able to share information about how you can bring hope into the lives of those people that are homeless. That's my why. My wife keeps saying, why don't you just retire? I'm not the retiring type. This is too important for me to come and to share with you it can be done. Thomas is a child of God. God loves him. I love you. I care for you. I may never see you again, but I care for you. And thank you for sharing. Because these people care for you and for the others like you. And you probably had a rough childhood. They're abused sexually, physically, emotionally, mentally. A lot of trauma. Research is finding that chronically homeless have a lot of trauma, traumatic brain injury. They're in deep trouble, physically, emotionally, psychologically. It's not ours to judge and condemn. It's ours to bring hope. That's who I see the homeless individuals are. I hope you can shift your view, if you don't have that, to seeing them as a very important part of your community and giving you the opportunity to reach out and to be of true service. Very important. <laughs> All right. We're going to... Uh, Isaac Newton, you know who he is, came across this saying, we build too many walls, not bridges. And we inadvertently build walls. So learning how to build bridges becomes important. And that's another whole, I can spend four hours talking about that. Build bridges out of poverty. Very important. You're starting to build more bridges. Thank you for the willingness to do that. I'm going to whip through a lot of stuff here very quickly now because see, there's the national effort, you know, chronic homeless definition, unaccompanied adult, a disabling condition, been homeless a year or more or four times in three years. That adds up to a year now. Uh, and they have a goal to end. Very expensive, $48,000, $40,000 on the street, San Diego, Colhane, New York, John, the, the JAMA. Uh, we were $20,000. They're expensive, and there's a lot of research showing that. You have a continuum of care as part of this. It's an organization. California has $300 million that comes in here. Shasta County, $400,000. We get 8.5. I look at the per capita. California gets 7.9. This is the 30 million people per capita. Ut Shasta gets 415. That'll be a little lower because they didn't have the right number. Utah's 288. So you have, on a per capita basis, you have a fair amount of money in continuing care. It's not a lot, but still, on a per capita basis, it's more than we have. California overview. I showed, okay, here's California. 120% of the nation's population, 63% unsheltered compared to 7.5. This, this is all of California. Chronic homeless, 25%. 
uh, of, your, of your population is homeless compared to 14 and 6. 85% eight, is sheltered and annualized 1.3.5.8. Uh, and so that kind of gives you a perspective. Here's the one we did in Shasta. Utah approach, that's our state vision I mentioned to you. That's you've seen that. Our over homeless numbers were coming down. The recession hit, came down. Then we had a lag effect. Then we're starting to come down. We had a little bump here. We've had a lot of homeless families show up. A lot of the middle class are shrinking, uh, and so we, we ju we're just seeing that's a tough population. They're having a, a challenge getting housed. Uh, our vacancy rate's two percent in Utah, in Salt Lake County area. A lot of in migration. We our unemployment rate's like three point four percent. It was always two percent below the national average even during the recession. But uh, so you know our overall homeless populations or percent has stayed higher than we want. Chronic has come down. So we're still working on that. As I mentioned, when you take a chronic homeless person out, you put 10 and a half people in that same bed. <clears throat> uh, we have a state homeless coordinating committee chaired by the lieutenant governor. Cabinet level people sitting on it. The three continuing care sit on it. Other faith base, etc. So we have a state committee that approved the state homeless plan, the 10-year plan. Also, the, it, it, it approves the state homeless trust fund money that goes out, which we committed to do the case management. Uh, we have committees dealing with uh, discharge planning, affordable housing, supportive services. We have 12 local homeless coordinating committees. So I would see what you're creating here as a local homeless coordinating committee chaired by the mayor, the chair, and Kristen and others are going to do the legwork to bring that in, put it together. But we, we wanted the, the lieutenant governor. When we started, we changed that from some staff person. The governor said, all right, the lieutenant governor will chair that. We're on a fourth lieutenant governor. We educate them. We take them on tours, get them to buy in so that they're really engaged in this process. They speak every year at a homeless summit, do the state of the state homeless, you know, the, the state. So they, they're visible. They don't do the work. We did the work, but they're there to support us. That becomes an important part of this process. And so the state, the local committee, the model is, is chaired by an elected official. And then anybody that has a dog in the fight in that, those counties, for us, uh, were invited to be on this committee. So each of those have a 10-year plan. Wow, this thing is sensitive. All right, you guys back there working on this? So there's the state plan, here's the local plan. So here's the state committee, here's all the funding, federal, state, local, private. Uh, consolidated housing plan, continuum of care, all driven in here to prioritize it based upon the local plan, which is based on the state plan, to move these people into housing. So we call it centrally led but locally developed. Centrally, we put out the guidelines <clears throat> from the state, and here's where the funding is going, preference certain funding, and then local, they put that together, just like HUD is doing with the continuum of care. So you can do that locally for your elected officials, are there chairing that and bringing it in. So it took some time to get some of the elected officials to buy into that, but you would, I would find them and educate them and get them to buy into it. So that becomes part of the process. So the state, <clears throat> six hours down here to the four corners into Blanding. I went down there every month for many years to be part of their committee. Too many times I'd heard, you expect us to always come to Salt Lake, and you think it's shorter from Blanding to Salt Lake than from Salt Lake to Blanding. <clears throat> so I went out there and I became part of their solution and part of their committee. They saw me as part of their team. That became an important part of the consistent message of carrying out. This is what we're doing. Here's how we do it. And encouraging them, providing support. How's it ended? Isaac or Albert Einstein, it can't be solved by the same conscious that created it. You have to do a paradigm shift. The Walmart. You need to rethink it. A new vision what it's about. Housing first. Basically, as for chronic homeless, the core convictions, once the chaos is stable, then they can begin to deal with the others. Housing is basic, not a reward for clinical services. They don't have to go to the clinical service or treatment to have their housing. They get into housing, they stabilize, then when they're ready to go to treatment, and you're always giving them that opportunity, then they will take much, it'll take much better. Thomas went in, he was ready. And I'd been ready two years earlier, but it was available. He took it. Clean, dry, and sober. Own house, own television, and own recliner.
It's a harm reduction approach. When I heard about the harm reduction, you engage them in the process. I heard about it in Salt Lake about 15 years ago, and they were giving clean needles and condoms out to the prostitutes. I said, that's the stupidest idea I ever heard of. Just tell them to stop it. Don't do that anymore. That was my solution. I've now come to understand the harm reduction is you need to have a relationship. Thomas needs to trust me. He needs to feel safe. So then I begin to share information and say, you know, those drugs you're using are not really helpful. You may want to take a look another way. Okay, I'll do that. I don't command him and tell him, you have to do that in order to keep your housing. He'd say, stick it in your ear and leave. He needs low barrier housing. He needs to develop a relationship and some friend and support. Then you're able to deal with that because you have a community that supports you. Because you're taking the drugs because you're alone. You have underlying medical issues. You're in pain, you're suffering, you're hungry, you're cold. The drugs help you escape, right? Exactly. So the harm reduction is part of the process for housing first. Can be implemented a project-based or scattered site. And the residents pay. I mean, Hassan talked about you give free housing. No, they pay 30% or $50, whichever is greater. We're into accountability. They need to have a dog in the fight, skin in the game. Very important. You enable them, you just give free stuff all the time. Uh, <clears throat> and you move them directly from the street into housing, out of the shelters. Providers obligated to provide uh, not coercive support, continued tenancy not dependent upon participation in services, targeted for the most vulnerable in the community. Those are going to die. We had 92 people die that were homeless or formerly homeless last year in Utah. The average age is 51. Five years ago, it was 46. Life on the street is tough. It is tough. They die young. We don't want them to die. We want them to be part of our community. See, Thomas can go and speak to schools, come to your churches. Are you willing to do that? Okay, he's willing to do that. See, if I go to the prison, which I did for many years, and speak to the women, I've never tasted drugs, I've never drunk alcohol, I've never drunk coffee, it's part of our theology. I can't relate to people who are an alcoholic. I have no idea. But if Thomas were to come in and speak to them, they would know he was speaking truth. Not that I wasn't speaking truth, but they know he would know what they're going through. He's a powerful opportunity for you to share the message about hope. So are you willing to give out your phone number? He's right down here in front if you need to talk to him. <clears throat> so, housing first. We heard the idea. We had Samson Barrister who developed it come out in June. By August, we had our first five house. By September, our 17 house. We took $150,000 and said, okay, we're going to test this idea. We're going to make it happen. And right, since I was reared on a ranch and we had a wooden coal stove and I chopped the wood for the stove, learned to chop the big end of the log first, said we're going to take the most challenging, difficult, chronic homes people we can find, and we're going to put them in the housing because we'll learn the most. We're not going to cream this one. We're going to take the worst, challenging, difficult. We got the landlords to buy into it, and 22 months later, all 17 were still housed. The national average is 85% will be housed after 12 months. We became believers. At the end of the last meeting, we're talking, the case manager said, we used to sit up at the University of Utah, and we debate which theory of case management is the most effective, A, B, C, D. Now our theory of case management is anything necessary to keep them housed. Case managers believe, executive directors believe, state staff believe, county staff believe, city staff believe. We all became believers. It worked in Salt Lake City in Utah like it did in New York City. It worked. But it's $150,000, low risk, low cost, huge return. Huge return. We believed it. We knew it could happen. We did it with 17. You're going to do it with five, and you're going to do it with five. But in 2005 and four, this was a new idea. This was very, you know, Edge cutting, avant garde, you know, that had some research and they're just starting to promote it across the country. Now it's pretty well understood, a lot of research done. But you still have to believe it and experience it. So our pilots became very important. So I encourage you to do pilots. Start, 
learn. It's magic what happens. Our first 100 units. Our next 84 units. This is chronic homeless housing. This is the former Holiday Inn. Former Holiday Inn. 291 rooms converted down to some one and two bedroom as well as the singles. 201 rooms now from supportive housing. We have a head start and an early head start in there in the old conference rooms because we have families, about 50 to 70 children there, babies, preteen, teenagers. Very important. We're working with chronic homeless families. A day's in, 110 units for homeless veterans. This is the Muchatorium they're showing on there. It's 59 units, 70 beds for 55 and older. The only one who had any nimbyism because it's shifted from a mental health facility to a homeless. But now it's part of the neighborhood. They come over and do Easter egg hunts on their place. They should come over, do service projects. So it's becoming a very important part of service opportunity for those in the community. 72 units on the VA campus for homeless veterans. This is the one that opened up a year and a half ago. 70, 136 units, I'm told that number is incorrect. Uh, homeless families, homeless youth, refugees, and market rate. Mixed use. Uh, very great addition to the neighborhood. So, uh, this, and we have about 1,300 now, 80% uh, retention rate, 10% move out, eviction rate's about 6%. But when we evict somebody from one of those facilities, we move them to another facility because we're working to keep them housed. And they may take the second facility. Didn't quite take in the first one. Okay, we really care for you, Thomas. We're going to move you to this one. And if they do something there, uh, we may move them to a third, and if that doesn't work, we'll put them back on the street because they need to learn those consequences. You can't beat up your neighbor. You can't threaten them. They have the same rights you and I do. They need to pay their rent. They need to be civil, uh, keep the place clean. They get inspected. They get taught, educated how to clean, et cetera, et cetera. So but that becomes a part of this. And that 10% reunite with family. Find a significant other. Become employed such they can move out. Get a Section 8 voucher. And so 2% die, and 2% basically walk away. We don't know where they go. So that's kind of been our experience with what's happening up there. <coughs> so I picked this up in a martial arts book. When your vision is crystal clear, taking action happens naturally. If you had a sudden onset disaster here, you had an earthquake, you had a big storm, you would rally around, resources would come, and it would happen. A slow onset disaster, this kind of creeps in. You don't know what happens. Because if you had a sudden onset disaster, you have a crystal clear vision of what needs to be done. You need to clean up the streets, you need to get the trees cut, blah, 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 blah. So creating that crystal clear vision becomes really important. And that's what we talked about earlier that you're in the process of doing. <coughs> Whoops. I think I'm done. <coughs> anyway, we have questions. <coughs> Yes. Okay, so technically we're almost out of time, but I'm sure that he will Yeah, come up to the mic. The opportunity for some questions. So if you if you have a question, please go around the side. There's two mics, one on either side. Michelle has one and Bev, and if you're too shy to ask your question publicly, we did give you a card that we would love you to put it on there, um, put your concerns on there and turn those in at the back table as you leave. Okay. We're ready to start. Um, what's your question? You talk about the rescue mission. I think they're fabulous. I really do. They have been criticized for drawing people from other areas mm -hmm. uh, who are homeless and troublemakers. Oh, no, we don't are want you? that. Okay. Goodness, no. no. Yes. But has that happened in Utah? Do you have oh, sure. 25% of the people that come in we know are transients. Okay. So I've been asked, and we've been asked, if you build it, they will come. So what? They're going to come anyway. Thank you. So what? That's not going to stop us from uh, doing what we know is the right thing to do. Thank you. Uh, let, let me hold it. <laughs> I can't stand it. Um, so is five in one month realistic no. for us? I, I thought not. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, no, I, I so give you, me a I little give you, help I here. give you four to five months. Okay, so. It'll take five months. Okay, so that would be March. March, April, May, June, July. So by July 1, you want five people housed. Okay. And you will begin to pull them together, and so you pull the resources, and you begin to take a look at the, the shelter and everything else. 
and, you, and you're in a meeting here in about 10 days, you're going to say, all right, we need to have five people house. You tell me what you need. You tell me. And so, see, I had people come to me and said, okay, we need to get these houses. Well, we can't do it. Don't give me that, Barry. You tell me what you need in the next meeting in two weeks. I will go get it. They came back in two weeks and said, we can do it because they moved from a berry orientation to a solution orientation. I put a deadline on them. So real quickly, <laughs> July one. I was also told we should wait for the strategic plan to be no, done. No, start doing it. Don't wait. You know, no, no. Okay. You will learn. You will learn by getting those five hows. You and okay with that, home base? All right, they're okay. okay. And lastly, on your stakeholders, you didn't have the homeless. There was others. I didn't yes, know if and, others and, and included the homeless. Yeah, the homeless should homeless be there. Wasn't See, Thomas would be great. <laughs> yes. Yes. First, thank you for coming here to Reading. But uh, having experienced many different countries, having lived and so on and met humanity, the first thing I learned do not prejudge and approach another human being with respect. Yep. Now, what you had indicated in the plan, I think, is a great idea, and I think there are many in our community will participate. But one question I have is, with the scenario what we learn about individuals, how they got there, what would you suggest one can do in a community in our country to educate and prevent in the long term that this happens in the first place. Getting them to graduate from high school and get education from that standpoint and you have mental health issues that need to be dealt with early, so that becomes important. So one of the things that we have happening in Salt Lake is the pay for success, which you're bringing outside money in. Goldman Sachs put in four million dollars. And the, and the county is willing to say, if, we, if you have this school district, and they have an outside person coming in, in your agency, if you have them at grade level three reading level, the percent that graduate is much higher. So the county, so you get them there at the grade level three, then the county will repay Goldman Sachs and interest. So you're bringing outside investment money in and disciplining the system. So they're looking at long range, we're getting those kids educated, graduate from high school, so then go into employment. So that's the long-term prevention approach. Okay, we need to another question. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Pendleton. Mm -hmm. My question is, concerning the housing first uh, process, in mm -hmm. terms of bringing people in off the streets that have significant uh, alcohol and drug abuse, uh, or drug use, um, and putting them together with people that have come to terms with their alcohol and drug abuse past mm -hmm. that are, that are uh, well on their way to a clean and sober future. In your communities, the Housing First communities, how did you address resident uh, a neighbor situation where you have one person that uh, smokes m marijuana 24 hours a day next door and you have somebody right next door that's trying to move sure. past that. Sure. Um, the housing first is that you generally don't have the clean, dry, and sober in those facilities, although in our first 100 units, 50 of those units are grant per diem, which they have to be clean, dry, and sober, so the top two floors are clean, dry, and the next two floors are wet. So that's created a little bit of challenge, uh, but it still has worked, uh, and it becomes part of a personal decision and that kind of support. So, But generally, we have not those have gone to treatment program to clean, dry, and sober, and we're having more housing put together for that, for those that need to have that separation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you so much for coming today. We certainly appreciate your presence here in Shasta County. I, I have a question in terms of your housing facilities. Um, if you could elaborate more about the funding and, and who supervises those facilities. Are, is it, uh, do case managers come into the homes, and how do you make sure that you have a you know, quality of life for everyone in the facility. Sure. Okay. Uh, you all heard that. The housing authorities own, built those, and the, what, the Palmer Court, the Holiday Inn, was, was uh, rehabbed by the homeless shelter. So they manage those, and the, homeless, and the housing authorities manage the others. So they, um, and the funding is tax credits. 
There's 60, 70 percent of that. Uh, uh, the uh, state homeless trust fund, home money from the county, the city. So it's a combination of several funds, private donations, in order to get them built. And then the state is committed to provide the case management to do, because you have on-site case management, like 1 to 25, 1 to 20, 1 to 25. The Holiday Inn is 1 to 45, 48, a little higher than we want. So, uh, but the housing authorities own and basically run those. And that, that Sunrise Metro, that first one, that still looks the same. It's eight years old. It's still a beautiful part of the, the community that it's in. So it's very important that those facilities are case managed. So the case managers do case management. Property managers do property management. Then we have a social enterprise that comes in and helps them get employment. And the workforce services has on-site jobs. So, they, so it's all integrated to help them give employment opportunities and access mainstream resources. We've been told we have time for one more. One more. Um, I, what I'm hearing is that you expect that there are people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol that were, are going to be living in these um, apartments. Yeah, absolutely. And all that. What about the ones that are actually selling drugs there? Now, I know you say it's a criminal, but I, I see call the chief, and if they're committing criminal activities, the police are called. You have only a 2% eviction rate, and in mm -hmm. my experience, you have more people than that selling drugs that you need to evict. Uh, well, so that's, that's been our experience. I mean, we call the police, and, we, you know, and if they need to, they, they will be evicted, or they deal with it, or they'll be taken to jail, and then they come back. So you work with them. We don't want them to be out on the street. We work every way we can to keep them housed. But if they beat up somebody, you know, they'll be evicted. But we'll even move them to the next facility. So we're working with them, and the second time it will take. So you're not just saying, well, you had your chance. Tough. And then, so the state pays for that? Because in California, it costs about five to 500 to $1,000 to evict somebody. So does the state pay for that? No, the housing authority does. Okay, so that's figured it's in. Part of the, yeah, part of their okay. cost. Thank you. We done? All right, thank you. All right, we okay? Okay, before you all leave, I, I just want to say thank you very much for coming and attending. And if you want to get involved, there on the back of your program, there are some agencies that I'm sure you can call and find a way to get involved. You can contact Kristen. I think she has, is going to have a web page, and I know how to find her if you want to call me. Um, and I want to thank Sequoia Middle School because they, they let us use this facility for no charge, and Lenny, who does a fantastic job and takes his time from his regular job. And if you, and we want to continue to do these kind of forums, and if you are interested in the Women's Fund and becoming involved, there is a table out in the lobby. You can get some information on joining us. And again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Oh, I didn't tell you, did I?